Our session today is going to be a very, very packed session. We have one hour. I will hope I will address all of the best practices that I can think of uh, that would help you as practitioners, whether you're in a civil or a criminal, uh, municipal, a state, it doesn't matter because a virtual proceeding is a virtual proceeding. Uh, first and foremost, what I would like to say is uh, get yourself ready because anything could happen in a virtual setting, which means your power can go out. Uh, you may have a situation where you're not seeing your video on audio. So the best practice is dial in, zoom in, maybe 15 minutes before, which you all did today, which is excellent. Second thing that you want to consider is, especially if it's a hearing that you have and you are the host or you are the lead attorney on that case, uh, you are prosecuting this case, if my suggestion is as follows too. On my right-hand side in my chambers, I will hold it. I have my Microsoft Surface as a backup. I usually leave this as a backup because if I'm the host, if I get kicked out of the meeting because of a power outage, guess what? Someone else is going to automatically become a host, which means someone that is logged in, it could be a defendant in a case, it could be a party. They may automatically get assigned as a host. Once they are the host, there are a lot of things they can do in a meeting setting. So what I do is I always have a backup and I make that as a co-host. So if I get kicked out, that co-host is automatically promoted as a host. So I don't lose control of the meeting. In this case, if I get a power outage, I will bounce right back and Karen would automatically become a host because she is a co-host. It's a good standard practice if you're running a Zoom session, whether socially or for work, always assign a person that you trust as a co-host. So that will usually give you. And once you bounce back in, the co-host can give you the host privilege back and you're done. So you have a very seamless operation. And also if you give somebody a co-host operation, what happens is, and you can have 10 people who are co-hosts. For instance, in my courtroom, my law clerk, my secretary, they're both co-hosts. What the co-host is going to do is would admit people as they're coming in. Right now, Karen is taking care of this. As soon as people are joining in, I don't have to admit them. Karen's taking care of them. So when we are, as judges, are presiding over a proceeding, we want to be focused on who is in the proceeding and all those. So it's a good idea to have co-host. There is, again, no limit on number of co-hosts that you can have. Um, I'm going to be sharing a PowerPoint to start with. Let me just do this one. Share. And let's me go to my PowerPoint. All right. And Karen, I'm going to ask you to simply let me know how we're doing in the share one. Because there is a little bit of a lag, maybe 10, 20 seconds lag before this will pop up on your screen. Sharon, you, uh, Karen, you, are you seeing the PowerPoint now? Yes, I am, Judge. Okay, now let me just do this one and now I'm going to put this in the presenter mode. Now you have the first screen. This is our beautiful historic courtroom. If you attended my previous segments, I continue to use this one. It just as a reminder, the physical brick mortar building that we have on the left and looking on the right is a virtual session that we have. This is the world that we're living in. Um, for those of you who have not been into the courthouse since March, we'll go real quickly about this court operation. This is what you will see. You have signs all over the place. You have stations uh, like near the elevators, you know, for disinfectant. Your elevators are marked with no more than the capacity that they can have. This is our jury room, which if you remember the jury room in a 401 grand used to be packed shares of with the social distancing, as you can see, these are all spaced apart. A courtroom, typical courtroom would look like this with all plexiglass here and plexiglass around the judges. This is one plexiglass, this is another one. And obviously this is our courtroom where if they have a hybrid setting, uh, we will have a big monitor in the back. Now, let's 
get a quick overview of the virtual civil jury trial that the Supreme Court issued an order on January 7, 2021. This is, again, this is a summary. Um, you can look at the directive. You can, at the end of this segment, I have one slide with all of the important directives that you can uh, keep those handy. If you are a judge, keep those on, the, on your bench. If you are a practitioner, have those printed because those are going to be invaluable. The effective date of civil jury trial, you would say, judge, this is a program best practices for everyone. I understand, but I think going over this one would help all of us because what we are going to do in a virtual jury trial civil may apply in other settings. I mean, we're just going to extract what is important. Effective date, it already started February 1st, 2021 by consent only, which means both parties have to consent and the cases, uh, the first cases that are going to be selected are going to be very straightforward, uh, straightforward, when I say straightforward, simple, straightforward cases. There are five vicinages that have been designated for the phase one, Atlantic Cape May, Cumberland, Gloucester, Gloucester Salem, Salem, Monmouth County, and of course, Passaic is going to be Passaic vicinages one and Union. Now with regard to phase two, uh, this will be April 5th, 2021, where there is no requirement for a consent and it will be statewide. The whole idea is the phase approach is we will have a phase one. So practitioners, uh, the members of the bar, everyone and the judges, staff, everyone becomes familiar. We learn from our own trial that we have, uh, the first trial that we have in phase one, and we can use it in the phase two. All civil case types are eligible for a virtual jury trial, uh, which means all dockets and all tracks. Three, jury selection will be 100% virtual. What that means is there's not going to be any in-person jury uh, selection process. It will be all virtual. And just let me just comment on the jury selection process. Uh, as you know, Passaic Vicinage, um, and uh, by the way, you know, uh, of our assignment judge, Judge Capicella, uh, who is also chair of this COVID-19 uh, implementation, implementation team, uh, he has been in the forefront. Uh, as a result of his efforts, our vicinage was designated and we designed and we implemented and the virtual jury selection was born in Pacific vicinage. So we're you know, we all got to be proud of this one because this is where it began. This is where it was initiated. This is where it was implemented. And now we have a full jury selection. Uh, in fact, at 2.30 today, I'm going to be doing a hands up. Uh, we have three grand jury panels who have been doing a phenomenal job. Um, the last time that last week I was taking one of the jury indictment was a 29 count indictment against five or six individuals. Uh, they're handling very, very complex cases. Uh, very, uh, you know, these cases are at one point, you would have said, how can these jurors be able to do all of this? Folks, they're doing this and the jurors love it because they don't have to leave their homes and they can do this from the comfort of their home. Next one is jury voir dire questions. There would be an expanded question and I will go through some samples and then there will be few open-ended questions specifically addressing COVID-19 and the technology and the privacy issues. Additional alternates will be selected, one for expedited matters and two for a longer trial. Six, technology assistance of jurors, uh, including onboarding. Onboarding would be provided for those jurors who need to get themselves accumulated or, you know, the be able to log in and do all of the things that they need to do in a virtual setting. We will provide them just like what we have done for the grand jurors. Um, electronic technology would be provided, uh, which is physical tablets. These are Samsung tablets with the jurors will hold on to during the entire duration of the trial. And this is significant because we do not want the technology divide to prevent a potential juror from serving on a jury. Uh, there will be a very comprehensive pretrial conference. I will get into this one pretrial conference in a bit. 
uh, jury charge would be enhanced to address the issue, privacy issues, and the issue regarding deliberations and on the fact that we are virt appearing virtually. Electronic evidence, there is a specific directive from Judge um, uh, Grant, which I'm going to talk about it, the directive as to the electronic uh, evidence, submission and handling of those witnesses. And finally, the jury deliberations. Jury, jury deliberations will be completely, completely virtual and there will be a enhanced charge covering that as well. This is my, uh, if you, so I'm gonna let me just move this one a little bit. Um, okay. Um, this is my virtual hearing checklist. And I think this is uh, kind of captures most of the things that we would like to consider, whether you are a practitioner, whether you are a judge, whether you are a party, I think some of these things that I have put down on virtual hearing checklist are important for us. Number one, we want to know the caption of the case. What type of case is the state versus so-and-so, the docket number and the date, the hearing date, time, and the exhibit exhibit submission deadline. I usually have this one ready uh, at the time of pretrial conference. Whether this is gonna be open or a closed proceeding, if you're in the family proceeding, if you're doing a CIC proceeding, uh, other proceeding that are closed proceeding, I would like to have them marked and I would like to have them addressed at the pretrial conference so that everyone knows whether this, this is an open or a closed proceeding. Obviously, if it's a closed proceeding, it's not gonna be live streamed. Uh, in the criminal part, almost all of them, the general rule is every proceeding is live streamed except for the ones where the judge has decided that this should not be live streamed. For instance, if I am doing a proceeding, which is like last week I did uh, in-camera review with counsels of, uh, of personnel records of a police officer who was involved in an incident, obviously that's a closed proceeding. Uh, I did not want to have this live stream and still call it a cold close proceed. So it makes sense. Uh, but the important thing is we got to know these things before we are in a proceeding. So I do this one pre-trial conference, a very, very comprehensive conference where we address all of these issues, interpreter language issues, uh, which interpreter. Uh, sometimes what happens is there was an instance where we had a competency hearing and uh, during the competency hearing, um, the individual who needed the interpreter said, I don't understand the interpreter. Uh, this was a person from Bangladesh. He uses Bengali. And the person who was assisting him with the interpretation was from India. And he, and he also spoke Bengali, but this was from Indian side. That's a different dialect. They don't communicate. They don't understand, even though the language for both is Bengali. So we got to be a little bit careful about when we do request an interpreter, what language, what dialect. Jury trial. It is a jury trial or is a bench trial. If it's a bench trial, there are certain things with witness examination, exhibits, marking, and what certain things are, we can handle them differently. So if it's on the criminal side, if it's on the civil side, if it's a jury trial, uh, there are certain things that we may want to address. Exhibits, I usually ask councils to have all exhibits pre-marked and provided to the court at least seven days in advance if they are able to. And the electronic exhibits type that you're going to be introducing, is it going to be a document? If it's a document, I would say, please provide this in a PDF format. And the specific guidelines from Judge Grant on electronic evidence is, you will hear this word, uh, the PDF documents have to be flattened. And you would say, what do you mean by flattened? Flattened simply means the PDF document, consider this. Let's suppose you're filling out a fillable form, PDF form, and the form that you're filling out is a wire transfer that you would like to have. And then you're putting down the bank's name, the account number in the form that the bank provided you and then you put down the amount to be transferred to the, the amount and the bank the, to which it has to be transferred to. Let's say this is your son who needs $1,000 and you put this on the form. Now that form is a fillable form. If for some reason you leave your monitor on and then you step out and let's say you are in uh, traveling and you are in a motel and you left this 
for a brief moment, someone can come in, right? Type in their account number, hit the send key, the money now got transferred to somebody else. That's a very obvious example, right? Now, let's suppose you didn't leave the PDF fillable form, but however, what you did was you sent this form to someone to say that here's my PDF document I'm sending you, whether it's a plea form or another form. Now, if that PDF form was not locked or flattened, what that means is the other recipient who's receiving this can fill out any information that they want, and then they can lock it. Then this becomes your submission. So we got to be careful about sending documents, which is a PDF, and not locking it, right? Locking simply means there is a way you can do this one. It's rather straightforward. And if anyone has any questions on how to do this one, uh, just send me a note to my law clerk, and I will forward you the instructions. So that's about documents, how they are flattened. Are there images that you're going to be submitting? Are these going to be pictures? If they are pictures, uh, the type of format the pictures are going to be. Uh, are you going to be providing an audio recording uh, as an exhibit to be used during trial? It's important because, again, the format of each of these exhibits would make a big difference because not all computers will have a program that will be able to upload that will be able to play the video. Most uh, important, like the examples, uh, you have um, you know, the security camera or the video footage from commercial uh, and places where they're recording. Each one has their own format. And when law enforcement goes out to grab those videos from them or take those videos, they need to convert this into a format where they can read and they can make copies for discovery purposes, right? So the same program needs to be on all our end because the host is going to be the one uploading this. They need to have that resident program as, as well. So we just got to be careful about all of these issues. Pro proceeding format, are we doing this virtually 100%, which means is everyone going to be virtual or is it going to be a hybrid format, which means is the judge going to be appearing remotely and the attorneys are going to be appearing um, remotely, but the witnesses are going to appear in person in a place that hasn't been agreed upon by everyone. For instance, the jury, grand jury proceedings are now, right now, all jurors appear virtually, but the prosecutor who's presenting the case and the witness, they appear physically in a courtroom, right? So that's a hybrid format because we have a combination of both. But when there is a proceeding where everyone is going to appear either in person or in a combination of or virtual, we got to know because I can tell you this, a full 100% virtual proceeding from a technology point of view is much, much easier because look at us, we're all appearing virtually, right? I'm in my chambers, you are wherever you are, Judge Damiano, you are in your you know, jury room having the sandwich that you're having, right? So we're all in different location virtually. The operation is gonna be very, very seamless because there's not gonna be much audio feedback and we are all. If once you combine physical and virtual, there is going to be some issues that are going to be have to be addressed. So the sooner we do this one, a decision, the better we are. Or is it gonna be telephonic? Uh, is everyone going to be connecting by audio and video? Because sometimes you may say, judge, I only want to have my client appear by phone. There is not going to be any video. My client is not going to be testifying uh, or the grandmother is going to be listening in, but she does not want to have a video and she does not want to appear on a video. Technology we to use, which platform are going to be using? You may think, but criminal in criminal case, most of the time we're doing Zoom, right? But in family poor, uh, family part, the platform that's being used is Teams, unless there is a proceeding that requires a Zoom. So each division uh, is going to be using a different type of platform. Or sometimes we use Polycom. 
Polycom is used most of the time in proceedings where Zoom and Teams are not going to be able to use for whatever purpose that we have. Also find out whatever technology, virtual courtroom that you're using, is there a room for breakout rooms? Uh, I will talk a little bit more about breakout rooms in Zoom versus uh, Teams. Screen sharing, are you going to be sharing, just like I'm sharing documents now, are you going to be sharing a document? If you are doing it, sharing a document, become familiar with how to use the sharing uh, document. Uh, annotation feature, for instance, if there is an annotation, I'll, I'll tell you this, let's do this one. Let's say I wanna annotate uh, this particular thing. I can just simply do this, right? I can circle this one. Now, that is the annotation portion, which is available right on the screen, right? Uh, let me just clear that one up. I don't want this one. Uh, undo. Okay. Now we have, let me just stop the annotation portion. Then annot chat function. Uh, you know, whether it's going to be a public chat versus private chat. Public chat means if you sent a message and you wanted this message to only go out to your client who is appearing virtually also, and if you hit the wrong button, that Kind of the confidential communication that you thought you were having, it became public now because everyone in this session is going to get your comment or whatever that you were discussing. So be careful about when you use, use the chat function, do a test run. Finally, a test drive other technology. I usually offer councils and the parties uh, a dedicated time, a dedicated day to simply do a dry run which means we're all going to do a mock session so that everyone becomes familiar with very, very important. And these are some of the things that you need to ask a judge. Unless you ask a judge, uh, the judge may feel that you are very comfortable. You don't need a trial run or a test run. If there are any other specific questions that you have, judge, you know, how am I going to appear on this session? Uh, you know, the, the, when you watch so-called Brady Bunch, you have 10 people. Judge, I would like to be right next to my client. Yes, folks, that can be done, but you just need to make a request to the court. Judge, I would like to have my picture next to my client, or I would like to have, you know, so-and-so next to me on a visual uh, Brady Bunch screen that we're going to see. I'm going to admit Linda. I think Linda lost us. She's rejoining us. All right, next one is Let's go through here. Now, setting the stage, best practices. These are some of the best practices uh, that I would suggest that you focus on for any trial that you have. First and for, foremost is recording. Make sure it is on the record if that's what you want to do. If I'm a judge, I want to make sure the blue man is on. The way I do that is every morning, the standard protocol is for my law clerk at 8.30 to call into Zoom can make that connection, have the court clerk on the other end confirm by listening to the court smart that the court, court smart is operational, it's on. That is done every morning prior to every session simply to make sure that the court smart is going to be remotely turned on and off. That's one thing. Second thing is during the proceeding, we want to make sure that the court smart is still recording. Why? Because we could have turned it on. And if this was a telephonic connection, if the call dropped, that we are recording would be stopped and without us even knowing. So that's important for us, especially the host to monitor. So what we do in court is the court clerk, law clerk, they're monitoring the court smart, live court smart feed that they're hearing whether everything is being picked up or not. That's why sometimes you will hear from judges saying, just counsel, that's not picking up. You need to speak a little louder. Counsel, that has not picked up. Let's go back on the record. Let's make a clean record now. Uh, security features, you need to know about the security features on the Zoom and, or any other platform. What do I mean by security features? If you wanted this proceeding to be a closed proceeding, there is a mechanism on the, at least on the Zoom, to lock the meeting. For instance, we're conducting this webinar now. People are still able to drop and join and rejoin. Why? Because the meeting is unlocked. It's just like a courtroom where the doors are not locked. Anybody can walk in and walk out, right? 
Similarly, in a virtual proceeding, if the security is unable to say lock the meeting, which means no one can join that meeting afterward. When do I use this as a judge? Uh, this morning, I had I have different layers before I go to the option. I call the nuclear option is locking the meeting or removing somebody. This morning, this happened this morning. I had a 22 defendant case where these 22, def out of the 22 defendants, seven are appearing from various state prisons. They're serving time. There is an appeal that we're handling on a remand because the Supreme Court uh, came with the decision on passcode, whether defendants are required to release their passcode. So these are 22 defendants and few of them are not detained. One person happens to be a non-detained person. I see the screen. This person has no shirt on. I mean, really? No shirt on? So immediately I said to him, Mr. Nevers, put a shirt on. And in the meantime, I said, I'm going to remove you, put in the waiting list. It is almost, and believe me, you know, if, if this, was, this was a physical courtroom, I had to get the sheriff officer, the sheriff officer have to talk to them. This is done instantly. I just hit one button, boom, he's out in the waiting room. I gave him about five minutes and I clicked it back. I see him with a shirt on. I said, Mr. Nevers, thank you very much. This is a court proceeding. That's how quickly you can remove somebody. Now, there was one person who was a defendant uh, appearing from Northern State. And these were all multi, you know, co defendant 22 of them. So some of these folks, they have not seen each other since their last appearance about two years ago. So while I'm trying to connect other detainees, two or three of them are having a nice conversation. And I said, no conversation, please. We're having a proceeding. But they still want to just do gesture. They want to talk. So one person did not get the message. So what I did was I said, all right, sir, I'm going to put you in a waiting room until we're ready with you. Boom, one button out in the waiting room, and they are going to wait until we allow them. So those security features are important if you're a host. Those security features are important if you want to let the court exercise uh, there were those options I call the nuke buttons, right? I mean, you can ask the judge and you just need to be familiar what is out there. Tech fails, how are you gonna manage a tech fail? Let's say there is a power surge and you are in the middle of a hearing that you get kicked out. Should never happen to anyone, right? What do we do? You could buy a, you know, sometimes they come on sale. I bought this one, five of these for my home, for my kids, uh, a backup, three hour, five hour battery backup that you have. You simply always plug it in and you plug your device into that one as if there is a power outage, automatically it would switch to and it would give you juice for about three to five hours. That's important. Uh, or if you have a document that you're working on and you spend almost two hours on a brief, and then you forgot you didn't save this one and you're not saving this as often and the power goes out, you lost a document. But if you have the backup, you would have saved and you would be able to still work on it. So that's another. Decorum, as I said, you know, you want to alert your clients, you want to alert everyone at the pre-conference that decorum of the courtroom should be maintained. No, if you have no shirt, you're not in my proceeding. If you're talking, and you're not muting, you're not gonna be in my, you're not gonna sit in my proceeding. Screen names, screen names, very important to impress upon everyone to have their screen names consistent with their names. Why? Somebody having an iPad. I remember my first segment with, we, we did the County Bar Association. There was a screen name of grandma's iPad. And she was the one who was asking a question of me. So I said, okay, grandma, iPad, but I didn't know this person's name. I want to address them. I had one case about two months ago, the person who logged in a defendant on a Monday, 30 cases that we have, his name appears on the screen name as top dog. How am I going to address this person, top dog? And immediately I saw this one and I say, sir, with your name, yes, you with the beard and a t-shirt that you are, sir, change your screen name. If you cannot change your screen name, my law clerk would assist you. So screen names are important. And always have our case information ready uh, to put it on, which means the docket number, the, the case that you're referring or appearing on, and what issue that you're here 
uh, to appeal or to address the court with. Key topics that you should also be familiar with, the audio we talked about, always check the audio. And this is some difficulty that judges who are in the municipal court and, and others who are participating in this virtual, sometimes you will feel that people have to go near and uh, uh, a simple solution is if you get an external mic microphone, the one that I have now, I'll share it with you. It just simply, it's a USB plugs right in and it, it's, it's, it has a stand on it. Uh, I don't think I paid more than $30, $40 for this one. It is a lifesaver. If you are presenting your case and you're making this argument to the jury, your oral argument, your opening, your closing, and you want them to hear, I think a $30, $40 investment, it's worth it because they will hear everything that you're saying clearly. And there's not going to be an audio issue if this matter goes on appeal because you have made the record. Similarly, on a video, uh, most of you who are appearing on a video, I saw that the quality is very good. But you don't have to have a high definition and draw all the bandwidth. You can simply set it up with a regular uh, you know, 1080 that you have. That should be fine because all our proceeding part of the record is not the video record. It's the audio portion through the court smart. So don't go crazy spending three, $400 on a webcam. As long as you have a good quality uh, audio video feed, that's fine. Share screening, which I'm doing now, it's a invaluable uh, tool that you have, which means you can share, you can annotate, you can do all of those things. The document that you can create, you can create very impressive documents for a jury, a color document, just like the way I have done on PowerPoint. You can use all of those uh, by creating and using a share screen option. Breakout room, crucial for judge and for the parties, for the attorneys. If you want to have a private conversation, uh, communication with counsel uh, as a judge, Certainly breakout rooms are great. Breakout rooms work. Uh, they save a tremendous amount of time uh, for both the court and for the parties. And the breakout rooms, there is no recording uh, going on in the breakout room. But some folks have uh, reported that breakout room conversations have been uh, known to be recorded. Uh, believe me when I tell you, Zoom does not record. You know how it's getting recorded is Someone inside the Zoom uh, breakout room, whether the law clerk or a court clerk, may have accidentally brought in their phone, which is not on mute, but is still recording on Zoom. That's the way it's getting recorded. It's not the Zoom is recording. Breakout phone room recording is disabled by your default, right? Unless somebody comes in with a device that is now recording onto Zoom. So just if you see someone from the court staff is in a breakout room, just make sure that you confirm this and they can easily do this by listening to the court smart. Virtual background, you wanna make sure that you have your clients have the virtual background appropriate for a court proceeding. Uh, no political messages, no derogatory messages, a simple plain uh, background is fine. Managing participants, great. This is a great, great topic. Like I said, you uh, a host can is permitted to manage the participants in terms of how they are displayed in the tiles. You know, we call each video uh, segment is a tile. All of these tiles that are, that you have right now um, on the tiles that you see, you see forty nine individuals. Sometimes you see 25. Depending on the program that you have, Zoom would allow you up to 49, seven by seven grid, a grid, right? But the default is five by five. So you see 25 or you see seven by seven, 49. But now the question is on with 79 uh, individuals, if you want to focus and if the judge wants only the attorneys and the parties to be seen by everyone, the host has that option. It's called, you know, it's, it's spotlighting. When they are spotlighted, everyone in the session is going to see the same group that the host has selected. Why is that important? If you are having a public hearing, do you want to see 100 people on different screen or do you want to have only the people that are in, on the council that are in the session, the attorneys to be seen, sure, you can spotlight them. 
Or if you are the individual at home and you are a litigant and you only want to see the judge and the party and the witness, you have the option as an individual, you can simply pin each video. And the way it's done, pin, is you go to the screen, the tile that you have, on the top you will see a little three ellipses or red dots, and you click it, you will see that it says pin, or do you want this to be spotlighted, right? So there are things that you can do on your own, depending on your comfort level with Zoom, it can be done. Uh, how else can you manage participants? Sometimes you may, as a host or a judge, you may want only the speaker to be highlighted, only the speaker. So that's a speaker mode on the top left-hand corner. There is a little thing that says gallery or a speaker. You put the gallery, it will give you the speaker only is the one who's going to show up. So that's the quick uh, summary of how you can manage participants, the options. Again, I'm not showing you how to do them simply because this is not a how-to, this is a best practice and the tools that are available. Some of this Zoom shortcuts that may be helpful. A lot of times you find that sometimes you want to turn your video on and off and you're saying, where is that button? Where is that button on the Android system, on the window-based system? If you hold Alt-V, you can turn your video on and off. And if you want to mute, unmute, you don't need to worry about any key. Simply the Alt key plus A will turn your audio on and off. I don't play with them now because all of a sudden you will see that your whatever you're saying, everyone is gonna hear it. And you can mute, unmute audio for everyone. As a host now, this is one of the things, privileges I think a host has and as a judge, you know, when you are a judge and when you're having a crowded courtroom, everyone is talking, everyone, this a jury verdict came in, everyone is a talk, and the sheriff would say, quiet down, quiet down, hold on, hold on. Well, in, in a virtual segment, you know what I do? The new button, Alt-M, boom, it mutes everyone. Everyone is muted. Just one click mutes everyone, and same thing, one key unmutes everyone, Alt M, and start and stop screen sharing, Alt S. These are some of the, uh, I guess, keys or shortcuts that you wanna have them handy right on a yellow sticky on your screen to use them. Montana. Montana. Evidentiary rules, we have 15 minutes ago. I'm gonna fuse rules that you want to keep it handy. Rule 603, oath or affirmation is an important rule in a virtual setting to make sure that the person who's testifying, if they are testifying and if they are under oath and they are located in the state of California, the question is gonna be if they lied under oath, which jurisdiction is gonna control? The way to get around this is as a person. I said, sir, and I usually do this, sir, I know I see that you're appearing virtually Council informed me that you're appearing from the state of California. You understand, you agree, you're gonna be testifying today. You will be under oath, uh, like any other proceeding that's conducted in New Jersey, governed by the New Jersey court rules and the statute. You understand that you agreed, boom, you're gone, you're finished. The rule six and 11, this is the golden rule for the judges, mode and interrogation and present presentation. Again, the judge has control over the proceedings. So simply ask the judge to invoke rule 11 uh, in terms of the, uh, if you want to call the witnesses out of order, if you want other things that the judge to consider. Uh, 612A, writing used to refresh memory. The important rule, because if you are cross-examining a witness or you have impeaching a witness and you want to refresh somebody's memory, you can certainly do so by sharing. But if it's a bench trial, no problem. The judge, it doesn't matter, it's a bench trial. If it's a jury trial and you're refreshing somebody's recollection, you don't want that document, it's not being introduced into evidence. You wanna make sure you do so either by way of a chat function or by sending a file, an attachment to the person who's on the stand to basically review the document out of the sharing of the jurors because you don't want the jurors to see something that has not yet been admitted. Use of defendant's prior statement, that's another important rule to consider uh, in a virtual setting. Calling and interrogation of witnesses by judge 614 is the judges, they do, you, that, that's a good rule to keep in handy. 615 sequestration of witnesses, how do you do that in a virtual setting? 
uh, you can tell the people not to log in. If this is being live streamed, they will be on there anyway. So what I try to do is I have another way of doing this. What I do is I ask them to log in. Once they're in, I put them in the breakout room by themselves and have another staff or somebody to monitor them. So this way we know what they're watching. We know they are in front of us. But otherwise, uh, a sequestration of witnesses, uh, it, it's going to be hard to monitor if they are not within a session. 609 authentication of the identification, that's an important piece of uh, rule that you wanna keep it handy. Now, Zoom enhancements, a few points about Zoom enhan enhancement. Uh, as you know, you know, we have been using since using this virtual Zoom uh, since last March. Viewing participants, as I stated, there are several options. Speakers view, gallery view. You can view by having them pinned, which means you're the only one who's going to see them. The person you're pinning does not know that you're pinning them. Uh, however, if it's spotlighted, spotlighted means this spotlighting by the host will mean that everyone is locked in into the tile. They would all see the same thing that the host is seeing. A uh, participant's grid, you can make it a 25 by 25, a five by five, which is 25 participants versus seven by seven, which is 49. And I left it blank here. I didn't get a chance to put on the Zoom enhancement. There are encryptions that are available, which means your proceedings uh, can be, are being encrypted so that, you know, there is, and just to prevent Zoom bombing, you can have your meetings locked or some other security features. Teams enhancement. For the longest, teams did not have the breakout option, breakout rooms. Team now has a breakout room. So just like what you do in Zoom, you can ask the judge to put you into a breakout room with your clients or the judge can have a breakout room with others. Viewing participants, same type of things that we talked about in Zoom, grid format, you can have five by five, seven by seven, what have you, and a participant's grid. And uh, this one, Teams has a, what we call a, together mode. If you want to be viewed, all of the participants, the host can invoke, enable the together mode, and you will all appear. Right now, you're appearing in tiles, right in a grid. If I invoked or enabled the together mode, I can choose you to be in a conference room on a chair, or you could be in a movie theater that you are all sitting in chairs behind each other. This is artificial intelligence that takes your picture and simply embeds them on a chair, on a table. And I think there is also one with uh, uh, somewhere you're hanging out in a uh, restaurant, uh, something like this you can have. Obviously, you know the appropriate together mode, you can select it. But again, that same mode, sometime it's going to be beneficial for you to have because of the Zoom fatigue, right? I mean, watching somebody, if, especially if it's not a court proceeding, if you're doing something else like a deposition or something, you may want to have this a two hour session. And always remember, always remember to ask for a break because unlike physical courtrooms, these uh, virtual uh, presentment, virtual proceedings can be very, very tiring for the eyes. Remember the rule, 20, 20, 20 which means in order to keep your vision clean, you know, every 20 minutes, okay, look 20 feet away for 20 seconds. That will help your uh, eyes to adjust and eliminate the, the problem that you may encounter by having uh, Zoom fatigue or viewing this in a virtual. So those are the enhancements. And finally, these are the directives that you want to keep an eye on and keep it handy. These are all very, very helpful. Again, I'm going to give this uh, entire PowerPoint to uh, Karen. All right, with that, I am done and I have time for questions. And please, when you have a question, we can do such this in an orderly fashion. You can raise your right hand, I will acknowledge it. If not, you can uh, just simply look under the reactions and then you can see uh, attention under reactions. You can simply put down a thumbs, a question, a hands up and I will acknowledge it. So Any I questions? I interrupt you, I'm sorry. I have to get the program yes. code at this point. It is, the program code is BP03. A little bit up, Karen, you have to pull, yep, there you go. BP03, B as in boy, P as in Peter, 
zero three is the program code. Judge Damiano, uh, I don't see the sandwiches there. I think they're pretty much done, huh? Okay, I'm only, I'm kidding you. I'm, I'm only picking on you. How are you? Okay, good. Any questions? I don't see any hands that have been raised. Let me just go to the second screen. Now, since we have five or six minutes, few other pointers on your appearance. Um, as you can see now, um, you know, I was doing this, I have a 27-inch curved monitor, which, you know, I said to myself during Christmas, my kids were using this for games. They play games on this curved monitor because they, I see now our dad needs one too, because I need one. I need, what I did was this curved monitor, it's because it's 27 inch, I have zoom and I split this into four different ways. So on one segment corner, I have my zoom session. On the other corner, I have teams, which my, uh, my court team alerts me, thinks that judge, this is so-and-so judge, the attorney is going to be late. Judge Capicello want to talk to you, get off the bench now. Things like those messages are going on the right-hand side. On the bottom, I have PDF documents that, as counsel are referring to, I can open up the brief on the left-hand side. And the fourth quadrant, I use it for my email messages. Is it crowded? No, I don't have to look at all three of them. But what it does is it gives me the option of splitting the screen. You can do that on your 19-inch screen that you have or your 22-inch screen you have. All you got to do is look for the option, split the screen in half or other ways that you can split it. So now you got two monitors. You don't have to buy a monitor. You can have, but if you buy a second monitor, they're not that expensive. I think they're like about $110. $120 for a 24 inch, that would be fabulous. Why? Because now you have one monitor right next to you where you can have all your documents ready and you can have zoom in front of you. And always try to look directly into the camera so that it looks good. But if you, if I do this, if I'm looking on the screen here, as you can see, I'm I almost feel like I'm looking down, right? Uh, that may not, somebody, someone may not appreciate, but if I do this one, I am looking directly into the camera and the camera has to be at your eye level. So right now, when I do this one, it's at an eye level and the screen, uh, you see a messy chambers in the background, right? But if I wanted to do, let me just show you things that, that I was talking about spotlighting, right? Now, I'm also going to do this. Uh, my commander, I'm going to spotlight for everyone with your permission so that everyone sees Commander, right? Now, let me just do another one. Karen, with your permission, I'm going to spotlight you also. Add to the spotlight. Now, you got two of them. You see, everyone is seeing two. Anne and Miss Damiano, I'm going to add you to the spotlight. Then you have three. You see, now, watch this one. After I have these, if I want to move them, shift them around, all I have to do is I can simply hold it. I can move them around. Let me just go back to the normal one. And I can show you how gallery view. Now I'm back to the gallery. See how quickly this was done? This is going to be very useful for you if you're in a jury trial and you want to have, you know, your client next to you. You want to be spotlighting, you know, the witness so that everyone can see. And this 50 people, 40 people on grid were tiny. You know, you don't have to just simply ask the host or the judge, judge, can I have the spotlighting in this order? One, two, three, right, left. This is also very important if you have an ASL interpreter, because ASL interpreter, sign language interpreter, they always would like to be in the middle. To the left, they want their deaf interpreter. To the right, they want the other, the party or whoever is doing the interpretation. That all of that can be done. And uh, if you, anyone wants to experiment, just do this one. You can, uh, you can, okay. I am not, I'm gonna remove the spotlighting now. Remove the spotlight, remove the spotlight with Karen and Ms. Damiano. Now, once I remove the spotlight, if you wanna just play around with the tiles that you have, just bring, bring your cursor and just hold it, click it and then move around. Then you will see the tiles start, start moving. You're not gonna log yourself out. Just, if you wanna try those things on on your end, just go, 
to any person that you have in the middle of the tile, you will see a hand and then click your button, cursor button, and then shift them around and the tiles will start shifting, right? This is to rearrange them. Any other questions? We have two minutes left. Judge Mohammed? Yes. First, thank you for your patience. Secondly, can you possibly tell us how to annotate? All right, I'm having difficulty hearing you, Judge Damiano, because uh, if you can come a little bit closer to your- How about uh, now? Yeah, this is perfect. This is I'm great. sorry, Judge. First, thank you for your patience. And second, yeah. are you able to tell us how to annotate? Yes. What you will do is, let me just show you real quickly. All right, let's do this one. We're doing, let's say, uh, sharing my PowerPoint now. Okay, you will see. All right, you see the PowerPoint, correct? Yes. Okay, what happens is when you share documents, you will see, uh, I just want to share my screen with you. Okay, let me just go back. I can just, let me do this because I don't want to do your, let me just do this. Uh, yeah, I can do this one. Okay, I, let's do my desktop. I actually want to show you how to annotate. Okay, now, um, Karen, you're seeing the grid, nothing has changed, correct? Okay, now, do yeah. you see on the top, uh, you see this thing that moving, Ms. Damiano? Yes. You see the share screen, uh, yes. this little thing is moving, correct? Yes, Judge. Yes? Okay, now, watch this one here. Uh, there is a button called annotate, you see this annotate now, when I'm hovering over? Yes. Okay, click that annotate, right? Now you got a little pen. Now I'm gonna circle the sandwich. I'm gonna go back to your sandwich there. Right there is your sandwich. You see the annotation now? Do you see or no? Let's say winner family. Oh, yes, yes, judge, thank okay. you. Okay, then you simply do click stop and then annotation is stop, right? Now, while we're at this one, let me just show you. If I wanna move you around, Watch this, I moved you, your tile. Do you see the tile move? Okay, uh, I don't know. Uh, Trish, let's see, I am going to move you up on the top. Do you see you moved up on the grid or no? Nothing moved, Judge. Okay, it's not I'm doing on your end, but if you hold it on your camera, right? And pick any tile, right? Any tile, you'll see a hand and then press your uh, cursor which is the mouse button, and then hold it and then move whatever you want. If you want to just experiment this later on, when you have the grid, uh, you're not going to log out. Just believe me when I tell you, just come into the any picture, the tile that you have, then you see a white hand and then click your mouse right or left button. And then you simply try to move it. Okay, thank you, Judge. Okay, any other questions? Judge? Yeah. Yeah, Joe Del Russo, how are you? Very well, Mr. Del Russo. You're the guy, you're the one with the laptop and with Matt Priori, you came in and remember that case that we had? Yes, I do, I do. Um, chicken chicken couple, baby syndrome, yep, okay. <laughs> couple of quick observations. As the host, it's something yep. to think about. I'm using an iPad Pro. Yep. When you say hover, you really can hover on an iPad Pro yep. or a phone. Yep. Um, it's really an act of a laptop computer. So something to think about when you're giving direction. I know you know this. But yep. I'm saying when you're giving directions as a host, yep. what you're seeing on a laptop may not be what the participant is seeing on the other end because things are a little bit different. And not all of the abilities are on a, um, a tablet that you get on a laptop. Something to think about. That's a great question. And most of the things that you're doing on here on the Windows-based system and also... Even if it's a laptop, depending on your internet connection, depending on how much memory you have, you may not get the full experience of what Zoom and other platform has to offer. For instance, you may not see the full 49 tile grid. You may be only limited to 25 because of your bandwidth. Your, your computer is not able to give this one. You're not losing anything. It's simply that you know your device is not capable. If you use a tablet, same thing, tablet may give you limited functionality. So it's always a good idea to test your device. The best devices, by the way, this is not a commercial, the best device that I found 
Microsoft, I have a Surface Pro. Surface Pro is beautiful. It's touchscreen. What I can do is I can sign off documents right on the screen and it is very powerful. I have done segments with Surface Pro. It works great. It is a laptop. It is also a tablet. Again, not a commercial, but just my tech thoughts. Anything else from anyone? All right, uh, Karen, uh, that does it for us. And I really appreciate it. And Thank I you think so uh, you, the next segment that you're going to have, uh, I guess it will be fruitful. I hope you learn something from this segment. It's always my honor and pleasure to share the knowledge. I, they, I, and I say this uh, because my dad has always said to me, so hell, knowledge was created to be shared. Knowledge, when it's not shared, is brings darkness. So that's what I want to leave you with. Uh, Karen? Thank you, Judge, so much for your time and for doing this for the bar. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Judge. You. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thanks, Judge. Thank you, Judge. Pleasure. It's my pleasure always.